A prominent family appeared to have a picture-perfect life, when in reality, they had serious problems brewing under the surface. Things eventually reach a boiling point when police are called to their home and find everyone in the house executed. As police investigate, they start to uncover their secrets and find out what led to this gruesome massacre. This is the story of the Kaler family. James Craig Kaler, who went by Craig, was a senior at Kansas State University in the early 1980s when he first met Karen, a freshman who attended the same school. They were both engineering students and were both at the top of their classes. As they got to know each other, a relationship sparked between them and they started dating. The couple eventually married after graduating and had their first child, who they named Emily. By 1999, Craig had worked his way up to become utility director of Weatherford, Texas, a well-paying and highly respected position in the local government. The young family later moved into a bigger house where they had two more children, Lauren and Sean. They were active in their community and were respected by their friends and neighbors. They were the type of couple that people strive to be like, happy and successful. Their children would follow in their footsteps and would also thrive. Emily enrolled in St. Louis College where she was studying to be a pharmacist and Lauren was about to graduate high school with honors. The girls also led a band, with Emily on the drums and Lauren playing bass guitar. It seemed as though the Kalers had it all, money, success, and a beautiful family. But while they outwardly appeared to be living the dream, it would later be revealed that behind closed doors, things weren't going so well. As the years passed, Karen started losing love for Craig. According to her sister, Lynn, Karen confided in her and told her that she was becoming unhappy in her marriage. She felt that her husband was becoming obsessive when he put her on an allowance and expected sex from her every night. She catered to his demands for the sake of keeping peace in the family, but deep down, she resented him. Karen wanted to get away from the house and stay busy while her kids were in school and her husband was working. She decided to sign up at a gym near her house and spent most of her time there during the day. She developed a passion for fitness and adopted a healthy lifestyle. She eventually became a certified fitness instructor and was hired by the gym. Karen found her new passion and turned it into a career. While working at her new job, Karen met another fitness instructor by the name of Sonny Reese. Sonny took an interest in Karen and befriended her. The two of them started hanging out and would meet outside of work. They spent more and more time together and eventually became inseparable. As they grew closer to one another, their relationship gradually turned intimate and Karen found herself in an extramarital affair. Not wanting her husband to find out on his own, she mustered up the courage to come clean and told Craig about it. Much to her surprise, he didn't have a problem with it. In fact, he encouraged it. Craig saw this as an opportunity to have a threesome and tried befriending Sonny by texting her and sending her flowers. But after a few attempts, he would find out that Sonny wanted nothing to do with him and was only interested in Karen. Craig didn't like this and told his wife to end her relationship with Sonny. Karen started to spend less and less time around the house and it became clear that she had no plans to stop seeing Sonny. Craig realized the threat that Sonny posed to his marriage and by June of 2008, he moved his family 650 miles away to Columbia, Missouri. He landed another job there that paid even more than what he was making at the time he was hired as the city's water department director and moved his family into a bigger house. Craig was hopeful that he could work on his marriage and that it would eventually improve. It seemed like Sonny was now out of the picture and he had Karen back to himself, but Craig would soon find out that this was not the case. After settling into their new home, Craig tried working on his marriage, but Karen seemed uninterested. Unbeknownst to him, she never ended her affair with Sonny. They secretly maintained a long distance relationship and would meet each other when given the opportunity. Craig's marriage was breaking down right in front of him and by the end of the year, it would finally reach a breaking point. On New Year's Eve, Craig and his wife took a trip back to Weatherford to attend a party hosted by some friends back home. Soon after they arrived, Craig spotted someone familiar. It was Sonny. He wasn't expecting her there and wasn't very happy to see her but he thought that his wife's fling with her had been over with long ago and didn't think she'd be a problem for him. He'd soon realize that that was not the case. 
Karen was excited to see Sonny and quickly walked over to greet her. The two of them sat together and chatted as they had one drink after another. As the alcohol took its effect, they sat closer and started rubbing each other's thighs as people watched. After a few more drinks, they wandered off together and started kissing in front of other guests. Their secret was now out in the open in front of everyone. Craig was humiliated and started arguing with her before dragging her out of the party. Karen would later say that after they left, their argument turned physical when Craig shoved her and pushed her to the ground. When they got back to Columbia, Karen avoided Craig and moved to a different room where she slept. Not too long after that, she told him she was leaving him for Sonny and made it official just a few days later when she filed for divorce. Craig desperately tried to save his marriage and called her friends and family begging them to convince her not to leave him. He said that she wanted to take all of his money and his children away from him and run off with Sonny to start a new life. At some point, Sonny started to get involved and reached out to Craig. One message she sent him read, She's only staying with you because she believes it's best for the kids. She doesn't love you, Craig. Not like you think she does. That's the problem with your marriage. Ask her and you'll see I'm right by the look in her eyes. On March 16th, 2009, Craig was arrested on domestic assault charges after Karen called police and told them that he assaulted her. She said that he hugged her against her will and left her with bruises. As Craig was placed in handcuffs and taken away by police, Karen was already packing her belongings, then took their children and left the house. She moved back to Weatherford to be with Sonny. When Craig was released, he returned to an empty home. According to people close to the family, it was at this point that his behavior started becoming unhinged. He was angry at Sonny and resented his daughters for accepting her. He felt betrayed and wanted nothing to do with them. From that point on, the only person he wanted to see was his son, Sean. In the months that followed, Craig's state of mind worsened as he reportedly became obsessed with Karen. She claimed that he stalked her, installed spyware on her computer, and slashed her tires. He was so distracted by his broken family that it started affecting his job. Coworkers said that he wasn't focused and would spend a lot of time obsessing over his marriage and showing them his family pictures during work hours. His problems had severely impacted his performance at work, and just a few months later, he was fired from his job. Craig had lost his wife, his children, his prestigious job, and was ordered to pay Karen $3,000 a month in child support. With no income, he also lost his house, and at 48 years old, he had no choice but to move back in with his parents. By this point, Craig had lost everything and was on the verge of losing his mind. In November of that same year, Craig was spending Thanksgiving with his son, Sean, while Karen took Sonny and her daughters to visit her sister, Lynn. Karen also planned to visit her grandmother the next day and wanted her whole family to be there. So later that evening, she drove to Craig's house and picked up Sean, leaving Craig to spend the rest of his Thanksgiving weekend alone. The next day, police received a frantic 911 call from Karen's grandmother's house. Seconds later, police received another call. A neighbor opened their front door to find a 10-year-old boy crying and pleading for help. It was Sean. Officers were immediately dispatched to Dorothy's house, and when they arrived, they walked into a horrific scene. The first person they found was Karen's grandmother, 89-year-old Dorothy. She was lying on the kitchen floor barely alive with multiple gunshot wounds. As police cleared the rest of the house, they made their way inside and found someone else in the dining room. It was Karen. She was shot twice and was already dead. Behind the couch in the living room was 18-year-old Emily. She was also dead with two gunshot wounds and looked as if she was trying to hide before she was killed. While police cleared the first floor, they heard someone upstairs crying for help. They followed the voice to an upstairs bedroom and found Lauren. She told the officer that her attacker was Craig. When asked who Craig was, she said that he was her dad. She was rushed to a hospital where she was pronounced dead shortly after arriving. Dorothy also identified Craig as the shooter before she went unconscious. She was also rushed to a hospital where she remained unconscious before passing away four days later. Craig had just committed an unspeakable act. He murdered his wife, her mother, and his two daughters. 
three generations of Karen's family. Sean was safe when police found him and told them what he'd seen. He told officers that he was in the kitchen with his mother when they both heard the back door open. As they turned around to see who it was, they were shocked to see Craig standing there holding a rifle. He immediately raised it, aimed at Karen, and shot her dead right in front of their son. As he made his way inside, Sean says he ducked down and ran out through the back door. He went around the house and ran up to the front door, trying to get back inside to get to a phone. As he opened the door, he watched as his father walked around and then heard more gunshots before running to a neighbor's house for help. Craig was found just hours later, wandering along the side of a road, and was immediately arrested. At the time of his arrest, he was armed with a revolver and some pocket knives and was also carrying gloves, a flashlight, and a few hundred dollars in cash. His car was found nearby. When police searched it, they found ammunition, a backpack containing food and toiletries, and an unopened bottle of clonopin, a prescription medication for anxiety. Craig was charged with four counts of capital murder and was now facing death by lethal injection. His bail was set at $10 million. His preliminary hearing was in December of 2010. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. His defense argued that he had a psychotic break as a result of the stress he was under after losing everything. They highlighted the unused medication found in his car and pointed to the fact that he didn't try to hide his crimes as evidence that he was out of his mind at the time of the murders. This would prove to be difficult because in Kansas, not recognizing that an action is morally wrong does not exonerate someone of a crime. A defendant would have to be completely unaware that they're even committing the act to be considered insane under Kansas criminal law. The prosecution argued that the murders were definitely premeditated. They pointed to the fact that he didn't miss a single shot and that he spared his son and fled the scene afterward. Expert witnesses who evaluated Craig on behalf of the prosecution testified that while he may have been suffering from clinical depression, he had to have planned the murders. Sean Kaler, who at this point was 12 years old, was brought in to testify against his father and recounted the traumatic events he witnessed that night. He said, my dad came through the door and shot my mom. I just heard her collapse on the floor from the shot. I just caught a glimpse. I think she was holding her leg. Karen's lover, Sonny Reese, also testified in Craig's trial. She told the court that she wasn't driving a wedge between the married couple because Craig didn't have a problem with her relationship with Karen in the beginning and that it wasn't until he was pushed out of the picture that he disapproved of it. She also testified that Karen told her she was being abused by Craig, but admitted that she never actually witnessed him being abusive toward her. The trial lasted two weeks, and on August 25, 2011, the case was handed to the jury to decide Craig's fate. After just two hours of deliberation, they reached a unanimous decision, guilty of all four counts of capital murder. Craig was now facing the death penalty. Craig's sentencing was scheduled for the following week. Just before the judge sentenced him, victim impact statements were read out in court, one of which was from Sean. He said, I do not want my dad to receive the death penalty because it would be hard on my grandparents. I do not want my whole family gone. Craig showed no emotion whatsoever and didn't express any remorse for his actions. As he was led out of the courtroom after his sentencing, he yelled out to his parents, take care of Sean so he's not raised by a bunch of freaks, referring to Karen's family. Craig's lawyers filed multiple appeals which were all denied. In January of 2023, they filed their last appeal in an attempt to overturn his death sentence. Craig is currently sitting on death row, waiting for a final ruling by the court. Sean Kaler stayed in the state's custody before later being released to Craig's parents. He has graduated high school in Kansas, where he currently works and resides.